I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not arrogant. Or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. Love bears all things. <laughs> Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. 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 Wherever you're joining us from, uh, your home, if you're tuning in for the very first time, you're part of the Chapel Street Church family, we hope that that song called The Blessing, those prayers uh, written for you, and that little intro video which we've seen now in a number of weeks uh, on the great chapter on love are an encouragement to you and to your heart. I know they are to me. Uh, I, would, uh, I would answer this question I'm about to ask you differently prior to this last little couple moments of worship, uh, quite frankly, but let me ask you the question, how are you doing? I mean, really, how are you doing? I, I almost thought about asking it this way. In these uncertain times, in these unprecedented times, in these un, you know, unusual times, my daughter was kind of jokingly keeping no track of all the commercials that began this week on TV with that phrase, some phrase like that, these uncertain, these unusual times. And clearly they are for us, but not for God. And not even for the church. It's not the first time the church has, has existed in, in difficult or challenging or, uh, from a human perspective, uncertain times. So let me ask you again, how are you doing? How are you doing really? You know, I think, what my observation is, when this hit first and we realized we weren't going to be able to have services in person, that we scrambled to pull off uh, streaming services, we rallied together as a church, and I think there was a little bit, although disappointment, also excitement about doing something new to keep the message going and find new ways to minister. And that got us through Easter. And now, if you're like me, you're beginning to grow weary. And uh, can I be honest with you for a minute? Uh, I, this is a hard weekend for me. It's difficult. As a pastor, you know, I, Mother's Day and Easter are two of the big days, big weekends. And, and they're both, the, the churches are empty on both those weekends. At least the physical facilities are empty. The church is never empty. And this is the weekend my daughter is supposed to graduate, you know, have the commencement service from college. So we kind of pretended, we, she dressed up in cap and gown, we took pictures as if it really had a commencement service, but I grieve that loss. And, you know, I'm naturally a glass is three quarters full kind of guy. I'm naturally an optimist. I don't get discouraged easily. My wife says that I'm chronically sunny or a dreamer, perhaps. But God spoke to my heart when I was, you know, internally wrestling through the very passage we're going to look at here uh, this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, one verse from this passage you just heard read in its entirety. This singular verse, I think, was exactly what I needed, and God spoke to me through it. I've been praying he'll speak to you through it as well. It's, it's, this whole passage is so remarkable, and I, I marvel at how God has lined up this series and these, these weeks exactly as we need them and how we need them. That's what he does. Let me read this verse for you. You heard it read a moment ago. But this simple verse is all we're going to tackle this morning. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Just one verse, but there's so much. We could take a week on each of those words, bears, believes, hopes, and endures. 
The very thing I was preparing to preach to you today is what I knew, God knew I needed to hear in my heart. So let's, let's dig in. Our series on 1 Corinthians 13, this ex- exploration and meditation on Paul's great love chapter written to a people who weren't excelling in love, the church in Corinth, he was writing to um, challenge and confront their lack of love. So we read this poem, an ode to love, as if it's this soaring celebration of how well they're doing. That's not so. So take comfort and courage. If you read this passage or hear it read and you feel like, oh, I fall so far short. That's okay. So did they. But it's God's plan for us to grow in what love actually is. And toward that end, let me give you the definition we've been using throughout this series, what love actually is. Love is the determined purpose to work to bring about the ultimate good of another person, regardless of how they respond or what it may cost you. Love is not how you feel about somebody. Love is what you do for someone, your action, according to the Bible. We think of love differently in our culture, but that's not what the Bible means when it talks about love. Last week, Pastor Brian looked at verse six, five and six, where we examined what love actually celebrates and rejoices in, the truth, the truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel. Here, in verse seven, we see what love looks like when it faces opposition or difficulty, challenge. So let's ask this question, what does it mean to bear all things? What does that mean? Love bears all things. I don't know what you think of when you hear the word bear. I think of the Chicago Bears, but that's not what it means. Um, I'm hoping that we'll see the Chicago Bears, uh, and and I'm bearing with the fact that we may not. Most of us hear this phrase and we think of, you know, having to put up with someone. Oh, like that guy is so annoying. I don't think I could bear another moment with him. We think of that kind of thing. Or we think of enduring, you know, uh, somebody's uh, idiosyncrasies that that annoy us. You know, she is so uh, self-centered, I can't bear it. Or we think of the phrase, just grin and bear it, right? As if you smile through girded teeth and pretend like everything's fine when it's not. We're talking about tolerating somebody. But is that really what Paul means when he talks about God's love? For God so tolerated the world, for God so gritted his teeth and put up with you messes, no. It's talking about something far deeper than that, than just putting up with someone or bearing with their annoying habits. The word bear comes from the Greek word stego. And this word literally means to cover over, seal up, place under, or shield. It often was used in reference to building a roof. That's interesting, isn't it? This sounds very different than putting up with somebody or just, you know, enduring their annoyances. To cover over, to place underneath your protection, your covering, your shielding. That's what Paul's talking about. This is very, very different than what most of us think of when we think about tolerating somebody. So when you tolerate somebody, you stay the same and that person stays the same. You just, you know, you just just put up with them. But to love them and to bear them means you create the circumstances, you facilitate an environment in which both of you can be transformed. Love puts up a shelter, in other words, under which others are welcomed and protected. Love builds a roof and welcomes all underneath it. Uh, this, an image that came to my mind when I was thinking and praying about this image and how to convey it to you. When my wife and I, couple, several years ago, had the chance to go to Zambia, Africa, and visit one of the hospitals with a ministry called Cure that we support through Serve the World in Cure, Zambia. And while we were there, we saw many wonderful things, took a safari, saw the remarkable ministry and the gospel work being done in the hospital itself. But our last time that day there in the hospital, the hospital workers, the spiritual director, the head of staff, the hospital director, and, and some of the, many of the doctors and nurses and staff had a barbecue or a cookout for us underneath this uh, fetch covering. You'll see a picture of it here. The word for this, this covering is mawasene mutenge. It literally means the welcome roof. It's a a traditional African uh, open-sided hut under which they gather for uh, uh, fellowship and and food. And I remember Harold, who was the the spiritual director of the the, um, uh, hospital, saying to us, everyone come under the roof. Everyone come under. All are welcome under the roof. There's room for all under the roof. 
And I remember staring around the people. There were Zambians there that were being trained as doctors. There, were, uh, there was uh, Dr. Jimmy, who was an English uh, from England, who'd come to, to work in that hospital and serve there. There was Italian doctors. There were Americans that were serving there. There were Zambians. There were Zimbabweans. There were people from other parts, of, uh, a doctor from Malawi, Africa. There were those that had been patients and now had been healed. There were us, missionaries. It was an eclectic mix brought under the same roof, the welcome roof. That's a good image for what Paul means when he says love bears all things. And I, I've been thinking about this question. Maybe I'll ask it, we could ask it together. What kind of roof are you building with the love of your life? Is it a small shelter where only the people that are like you are allowed in? Is there room under the roof of your love for all kinds of people, broken people, annoying people, people who don't think like you, don't vote like you, don't look like you, Love builds a big roof and invites all in. That's what Paul is saying. Love bears all things. It's a challenging and, and confronting question to me. That's the quality of love. Zo Spiro Zodiates writes, a Christian's love provides a shelter for every situation in which it finds others. And its shelter is comprehensive, not selective. It completely protects those that are brought underneath its covering. That's what it means to bear all things. You see, the power of Christ's love in us is not just the power to tolerate people. It's the power to believe the best of and for them while bearing with their brokenness because that is what he has done for you. The power God gives us is not just to put up with people. It's to believe the best in them and for them, even with their brokenness and woundedness and sinfulness because that's exactly what Jesus does for you. This is what Isaiah 53, 4 says. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He bore our sins, not tolerated them, not put up with them. And because he bore our sins in his body on the cross, we then come under the covering of his grace, welcomed under the protection of the roof that Christ builds. Next, Paul says that love believes all things. Again, we have to be careful here. This does not mean that if you're a loving person, you have to believe whatever you hear or read or see. That just means you're dumb. Love is not stupid. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you're, just, you're gullible or you believe everything you're told. What it means is love believes all that should be believed in every circumstances, even when there's evidence to the contrary. Because we have to combine verses thir verse 7 with verse 6. Last week, Pastor Brian talked to us about how love rejoices with the truth. So we have to put rejoices with the truth with believes all things together. Meaning in every circumstances, even when you'd be easy to, to jettison your belief, love holds on to the truth and believes the best. In all situations, in all circumstances, love believes all things that should be believed. The Greek word for believe is the same key word, same root word as the word for faith. And faith, if you think about biblical faith, is not blind faith. Faith is forward-looking. Faith is always reaching, straining forward for, for what would come, for the best. Every mother, every parent knows this, understands this. You know, I used to coach football and, co and coach middle school wrestling as a volunteer and Sometimes parents' uh, faith and belief in their children exceeded their children's abilities. But then I had children that grew and were involved in sports, and I understood. We all do that. In a way, Paul, Paul is saying, love bears all things, builds a big, big roof under which all are welcome, and believes all things, strains forward and believes past, sees through past the present difficulty, the present struggle, the present brokenness to what someone could become. Isn't that what God does for us? Let me tell you about a mom I know named Monica. Monica grew up in a Christian home. Loved by her parents, taught the things of God early in her life, had a very deep and real, authentic faith in Jesus. It, it, it went all the way to the bottom in Monica's heart. Monica wasn't lucky in a romantic love in life. She married an older man uh, who was successful in business, was a government official, and um, his name was Patrick, and he... He turned out to be uh, less than an ideal husband. In fact, he was abusive, verbally, sometimes physically. He was unfaithful. 
while he provided financially, it was not a happy marriage. Monica endured. And they had three children together. All of their children were bright and did well in life, but the oldest child, Augie, was a problem. Well, he was the quintessential rebellious or prodigal son, you could say. Rejected his mother's faith and for, many, for a while looked like he was going to go the way of his father. He was successful, but he was tormented inside. Made tons of self-destructive decisions in his life. Went from bad relationship to bad relationship. Gave into every desire of pleasure you could think of. And was very, very far from God. But Monica never stopped bearing. There was always room under the tent of her love. Believing, hoping, enduring all things. And one of uh, Monica's friends, uh, actually uh, her pastor, said to her uh, to encourage her because he knew how much she prayed and how much she believed. He said, it's not possible that the son of so many tears, so many prayers, and so much faith should come to ruin. And she kept that in her heart. Many years later, as, a, as in his 30s, Augie would pick up a Bible and read through the book of Romans. And in reading Romans, God undid him. And he eventually came to trust in Jesus. Monica's greatest prayer for him. And he was baptized the following Easter. His mother was able to, Monica was lived to see it, her own son's baptism. And she died just a few months after that. Do you know who that is? Have you ever been to Santa Monica, California? Do you know what Santa Monica's named for? Saint Monica, the mother of Saint Augustine. Augie is Saint Augustine. Arguably the greatest father of the church, the early church fathers. One of the most significant theological minds in all of human history. It'd be hard to write the Christian story, the story of the church, and not account for the impact of St. Augustine. But very few of us know the story of his mother. Believing all things, bearing all things, hoping all things, enduring all things. He writes of her in his confessions, She's the one now gone from my sight, who for many years believed and prayed that I might live in God's sight. Though as a young man I could run, I could never outrun my mother's faith or her prayers. God used the bearing, believing, hoping, and enduring love of his mother. So love is long-sighted, not short-sighted. Love sees through and past what may be dark and difficult in the moment. Love hopes all things, Paul says then. Believes, or bears, believes, and then hopes all things. Hope is the central characteristic of the gospel. It's, it's what characterizes God's people, joy and hope. No Christian can truly at heart, at their deepest down level, be called a pessimist or a fatalist. I realize you might be more of a realist. Maybe, you're, maybe you have a harder time seeing the bright side of things naturally by your temperament. But if you know the love of Christ, if it's in your heart, then, you, then it's not really possible or true of you that you could be a, a pessimist. You can face any circumstance in life, no matter what comes, with a deep undergirding hope. That's what Paul's saying here. There is a river of hope running through the heart of every Christian, true person that's been flooded with the love of Christ. That can't be taken away. There is no circumstance or situation that a Christian cannot face without hope. We lose sight from time to time, but it's there. And the life of Jesus is marked by hope. If you think about Jesus' life, it's marked by hope. Though he had many reasons to be sorrowful, he wasn't immune to pain or difficulty or betrayal or grief. His teachings are filled with hope. Think of his parables. The lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. What are these but stories of hope? His miracles are full of hope. Healing of the leper, those who were hopeless and cast aside by society. He sought out. Even the way he treated his disciples is filled with hope, if you think about it. You read through the gospel accounts, and these guys are always getting it wrong. They're always misunderstanding it. They're always stumbling. They're all, and Jesus is sometimes, I think, is not only patient with them, when I would be exasperated, he sees what they could become. He sees what they will become hopes all things. Hope expects the best. It does not assume the worst. Some, some, I have some friends who go through life thinking, well, if I expect the worst, then I'll never be disappointed. I'll prepare myself for it. And then if something good happens, hey, I'll be pleasantly surprised. I understand how we'd be tempted to approach life that way. 
But from a spiritual perspective, Paul says, the love of Christ flooding into your hearts, you can bear all things, build a tent big enough for all to come underneath. You can believe all things, the truth, even when it's difficult. And hope, a deep down optimism that you know who holds the future. Love is neither a denial nor despair. It bears, believes, hopes, and then Paul says love endures all things. The Greek word here is the word hupomine, and it literally means to, um, to place or remain under, to stay underneath, particularly a burden or a strain or a difficulty. So when it says love endures all things, it means it stays underneath this burden. In other words, love doesn't give up. It doesn't quit. It doesn't throw in the towel. It doesn't say, you know, enough is enough. I've, I've, I've suffered enough. I've had it. Love doesn't do that. To refuse to move, even when faced with pain or under a heavy burden. You know, there's the, in that video that precedes every sermon of this series, there's that moment in the video when, when the, this phrase is read, love endures all things. And it's a little girl, Kendall, walking to her mom, Jillian. Kendall has special needs. And she's walking to her mom, and her mom says, endures all things. I, I see that every time I get emotional. I get choked up. It's a perfect image with a smile and joy on her face. Love presses on, presses through the difficulty, the challenge. You know, I think love is best revealed in how a person endures suffering. One of the ways you know if love is genuine, if it's true, if it's, if it's really there, is in how someone suffers. I've told this story many times before, but it's worth telling again. When I first came on staff here as a youth pastor many years ago, over 20 years ago, one of the best volunteers I ever had, and I know Pastor Sterling would say the same thing because this person uh, was, worked under both of us as a volunteer leader, and then on our staff for a while, it was Kim McCart. Kim was uh, a volunteer under me, a staff member uh, uh, briefly under me, and then under Sterling in, in student ministries. She loved uh, high school and middle school girls with, a, with a, a reckless, fierce passion. She was kind. She was tender. She was faithful. She was a remarkable mom. And she died of brain cancer way too young. And I remember, I'll never forget, at her funeral, her niece, who's this strikingly beautiful fitness model working in New York City, got up and told her own story to faith and how her Aunt Kim impacted her. And what she said was this. She said, I watched my Aunt Kim de deteriorate from brain cancer, this awful disease, take her. And she remained at her core the same gracious, kind, faithful, and loving person while suffering horribly. And then she said, I got pneumonia for a couple of weeks, got a bad cold and developed pneumonia for a couple of weeks and I missed out on a photo shoot job opportunity that I was hoping for. I had a breakup with a boyfriend and I was completely in the tank in depression. She said, whatever I thought I had in life was gone in two weeks from sickness and a breakup, but my aunt suffered infinitely worse than I did and what she had stayed. She said, I realized that her faith wasn't fake. It wasn't a joke. It was real and I wanted it. Watching her aunt suffer proved to her that's how God's love broke through into her heart. I think sometimes when God does his best work in how we endure hardship in us and in those that are watching, that are near, love endures all things. Things that would otherwise crush or demoralize us do not because of love, enduring love of Christ in us. Hebrews 12, 2 says, this is right after he says, let us run the race with perseverance. He says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning or despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured. He remained under that burden. Why? Because love doesn't quit. Love doesn't throw in the towel. Love never runs out or gives up. And we then can bear and endure because our hope and belief is in Christ. Those are the four words, right? We can bear and endure in all things because our hope and our belief is in the person of Jesus Christ who bore and endured for us. This is not a vague optimism based on our wishes. 
This is the absolute certainty of what we have in Jesus. He's the guarantee because he bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things for us. So Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul gives us the first five verses of this remarkable chapter, gives us a great description, I think, of what this really means and looks like in the Christian heart. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That last verse, verse 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts. Not just a little thimbleful, not a little drop here and there, not just a little taste, but poured out to overflowing into your heart through the Holy Spirit that's been given to you. Let me, let me wrap up by just giving you um, sort of the JFV, the Jeff Frazier version of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Love covers, shields, and protects all people, even those that others would despise. Love strains forward with all of its might to believe the very best in every situation. Love is always looking for the good and expects the best in others and for others. Love never surrenders. Love never quits. Love will never give up. Let me just give you now three practical ways that you can Use this word bearing, which means to cover. Let's go back to that word for a minute. I'm going to give you three things that you can do this week for those that you love, for all people. First, cover them with your prayers. Who have you stopped praying for that you used to pray for a lot, but maybe you've grown weary or you thought, I don't know if it's making a difference? Love never gives up. Cover them with your prayers. Second, cover them with encouragement. Who needs a word from you? I received a card, an old-fashioned card, not a bill, not an email, not a text, not junk mail, an actual card in an envelope this week in my mailbox, and it said, the, it was titled The COVID Chronicles. This person is just writing letters to encourage people. I can't tell you what that meant to me, just to get that little card, the little COVID Chronicle encouragement note in my mailbox this week from somebody in our church. Who needs a word that only you could provide and God could provide through you? Cover them with encouragement. And number three, cover them with endurance. Some people may be tempted to give up in whatever they're facing in life. They may draw strength from your endurance for them. You don't give up on them and for them. So let's, let's do that this week. Let's cover those people around us with our prayers, with our encouragement, and with our endurance. That's precisely what Jesus is doing, has done, and will do for us. Let's pray. Father God, this single verse in this remarkable chapter has so much to say to us, we've only scratched the surface. But mostly we marvel at how this verse points not just at what we ought to do and how we ought to live, but far more it points to you, Jesus. You are the one who has borne and is bearing all things. You are the one who believes all things. You are the one in, in whom we have hope and who hopes all things for us. And you are the one who has endured all things and is enduring and in you we can endure. We give you great praise and thanks for who you are, for your great love. In Jesus' name, amen.